lose a loved one, especially someone who loses a child, who never expected to lose a child. You, you always expect the parents to go first, you know, don't, don't we? And it's such a hard loss when it was a tragic accident. Um, but we were, we were a lot of the counseling classes and a lot of the, um, like, debriefing we learned through the sheriff's office. You know, go home, hug, hug each other a little bit tighter. Show, show some love. Show some love. And I, I'm glad a friend of mine, Anita, out online says, make it uncomfortable. <laughs> so they know. So they know. The one thing that was cool about the funeral I did last Thursday was that mom and him really had a good communication about how much they love one another. So that was a comfort for her when it came down to the end. So as we open up, let's open up with a word of prayer. Um, and we'll get into this service. I hate to end it because the, beauty, the weather's so nice. Tommy Turtle's got his head up. You paying attention, Tommy? He is. Yep, he gave me the nod. Father, we thank you for this beautiful day. God, I thank you for the rest that we can find in your spirit. For when we go through difficult times, that we, we have a place we can run to, a place we can find shelter, a place we can find peace. As we struggle with the world and the crazy things that are going on, as we struggle with the loss of loved ones and those we care about, we struggle with health issues. Father, we need to be reminding ourselves that you're the great physician, you're the mighty comforter, you're the one we can run to. You are our everything. And I had somebody mention to me last night, well, what if you die? And I said, then I get to go home. That's a great comfort in my life, Father. And I, I pray that each and every person with an earshot would understand that the very worst thing that can happen on this earth can turn in to being a total blessing. We get to be in the presence of God. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I got that from um, when I lost my mom at 23 and went to her funeral service. They were singing this song, and I really need to find the backing track and sing it and have it for church. I can have look it up. It's called If You Could See Me Now. Uh, I think the band was called Truth, but I'm not sure. And it said, if you could see me now, I'm walking streets of gold. I've got my hand in the hand of my father. If you could see me now, you'd understand why I don't want to come home. I know you want me to come back, but I don't want to come home. It's so much nicer here. So i gotta, I got to look that up and see if we can get the backtrack. So come on up, kids. Paula, you're going to help. Yay. I, my, fir my first hint, don't touch it. It's mine. 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 Come on, Travis. See, I don't know. I didn't. I didn't touch him. I touched one, and then moved the rest of them. He snuck in late. I was. Say, I was over there saying my greetings. You weren't here. Almost marked you on the attendance sheet. Almost marked you on the attendance sheet. What did I do? Did I lose the song list again? Good. I'm getting good at that technology stuff. You can play a game and you can act out a part Though you know it wasn't written for you But tell me how can you stand there with your broken heart Ashamed to play One thing can lead to another It doesn't take any sacrifice Oh, father and mother Sister and brother If it feels nice Don't think twice Shower the people you love with love Show them the way that you feel Things are good Better. 
what you plan to do with your foolish pride when you're all by yourself alone. Once you tell somebody the way that you feel, you can feel it begin to ease. I think it's true what they say about the squeaky wheel. Always get it. Shower the people you love with love Show them the way that you feel Things are gonna work out fine Lightning in his fist. Our God is an awesome God. And the Lord wasn't joking when he kicked them out of Eden. It wasn't for no reason that he shed his blood. His return is very soon, so you better be believing that our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. When the skies are starless in the void of the night, our God is an awesome God. He spoke into the darkness and created the light. Our God is an awesome God. Judgment and wrath, he brought it down on Sodom. For mercy and grace, he gave us at the cross. I hope that we have not too quickly forgotten that our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns. Heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power. Oh, God. 
Here's Wes's favorite song. Even though he just said the last one was his favorite. They're all my favorite. They're all my favorite. <laughs> Jesus is alive and well. Jesus is alive and well. Tell everyone you see a tell them from me that Jesus is alive and well. He's seated with the Heavenly Father. He's interceding for you and me. Tell everyone you see a tell them from me that Jesus is alive and well. But now the rules are your king and your president's men. Coming of the Lord is nigh. You better get your house in order. He's gonna split the eastern sky. Get the message out to the people. Let's tell it while there's time to tell. Son of God is coming. Hallelujah! Jesus is alive and well. Jesus is alive and well. Jesus is alive and well. Tell everyone you see a tell them from me that Jesus is alive and well. He's seated with the Heavenly Father. He's interceding for you and me. And tell everyone you see a tell them from me that Jesus is alive and well. When they nailed my Jesus to that old cross well, the devil danced around with glee. He thought he had the children of God and he would take them and throw them in. continue our study in Genesis, if you remember last week, we had a cliffhanger. Remember it? Will Joseph become a slave? We had a cliffhanger. Will Joseph's dream come true? <laughs> Will the brothers come bowing down before their little brother Joe? Little Joe. Come on up, Bob. Tell us what happens in the rest of the story. Did we? Th you think we're going to go to part three, or are you just going to let God lead? Oh, there's going to be a part three. Good, another cliffhanger. Good, I'm going to have to come up with some cliffhanger questions. Is it possible? <laughs> Keep thinking cliffhanger. <laughs> Definitely. I don't know which song it was you just sang. One of them, you mentioned something about angels, and... You know, we don't give a lot of thought in the um, church today, or at least in a lot, a lot of churches. We don't give a lot of thought to angels. Um, some people think that's kind of a fairy tale-ish concept of angels, and part of that is kind of how they got romanticized maybe during the uh, Middle Ages and the Renaissance. And uh, But, you know, they had their take on them then too. But 
they're actually this book I'm finishing up on Celtic Christianity. They it's very biblical, and we've already seen angels in our study of Genesis to date. Um, and as the author of that book points out, that you know sometimes the angels appear kind of as angels, right? And then other times they kind of you can't tell if what maybe it's God Himself in an angelic form. And then and we've seen that we've seen those, but then sometimes they show up and seem to be in human form as a person. And there was a point there in Abraham's story where these strangers showed up and Sarah, um, I don't think we went into the detail on this one, but I think Sarah was cooking them uh, something, you know, over the fire and they were having a conversation with Abraham. But, you know, the angels you know, are real. They're spiritual beings, and they're, they have different purposes, messengers from God, uh, servants of God. And the Bible tells us that children are appointed guardian angels and that they are to watch over people that are going to come to salvation. Um, so, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot to it. I, I, I think some people go too far and almost become angel worshipers. You know, because they become so focused on angels, angels, angels that they don't have really, they, but they don't really, you know, are necessarily that interested in God. And I think that's a mistake. Uh, in fact, I believe it was in Revelation where John was so overcome with awe during the Revelation and what was happening that he bowed down before an angel and an angel said, stand up. You don't, you don't worship angels. Um, but that doesn't mean we can't respect these spiritual servants of God. Um, and I just thought that was interesting. It kind of got it. I think it kind of hit me with that, you know, reading this book that there's a lot that goes on that we have discounted. And the author goes on, he points out that we so discounted during the age of reason and rationality, you know, Christian stories, and I call them stories because when you tell a story, it can be a true story, right? But it became like a fairy tale story. And when the age of reason in the West, we became so dualistic, right? That means we became either or thinking, right? It's either science or it's spiritual. But they, they couldn't, we can't comprehend that it could be both. We can't comprehend, it seems, that some things transcend science, and maybe it's just that our understanding of science isn't there yet. And that makes sense to me, that there are things yet undiscovered. There's a higher order of things that we don't understand yet with our finite minds. Our science is only what we understand so far from human reasoning and logic. Um, and God has gifted us with logic. We don't want to be take the other extreme and throw science out and say science has no bearing. Um, Luke was a doctor, okay? Luke in the Bible was a doctor, the gospel of Luke. So, you know, the point is that we so divorce spirituality from science and threw Christianity out, right, kind of threw it out in the world, that there's this huge void that's happening today. The void is that people are coming in their humanity, they're, they're coming to reason, coming to understand that, wait a minute, there, there's got to be something more than just go to work, get a job, try to placate your employer and keep your position and work real hard and put your money in the bank to save up for someday, pay the mortgage payment and the car payments and all that stuff, and it's about getting stuff. And there's plenty of people, plenty of us that get caught in that trap. So people are looking for something more, but we're several generations now removed from a biblical understanding. So... You used to talk to people, and they would at least remember from kids, they would know something from some Bible stories. You know, they kind of knew about maybe Joseph, Noah, the flood, Jesus, right, went to the cross. They had some understanding of that, or some basic knowledge. 
now there's people that you talk to that have no, they have no idea what you're talking about. If you mention Jesus, they may have heard the name, but they associate those with some fundamental Christians that go around, you know, being rude to people, and they don't want anything to do with that, or people that go around being judgmental, pointing fingers at people, they don't want anything to do with that. They don't have it, they don't know what the gospel really is, so they're looking, and where do they fall into? New ageism. Different forms of spirituality, the occult, Wicca, all these different things, and they get packaged up as some kind of, like they're good... A friend of mine calls it the blender theology. You know, maybe take a little bit that you do know about Christianity, throw it in the blender, throw in some New Age, throw in some witchcraft, throw in some horoscope, throw in some whatever. Hey, whatever you want to believe, all roads go to the same place. They don't go to the same place. You can get into spirituality and get into some very dark things. Right, And it's a very dark things. If you don't have a foundation, if you don't know your identity. Now, I think in God's grace that, that he allows people to have a bumpy journey when we need to have that, if that's what it takes to, to come to him. And I think it's great that people are seeking, that at least they realize. But how are they going to find, how are they going to find the signposts? How are they going to find the way? How are they going to find the way home? It's not going to be from shoving religion at them. It's not going to be for telling them how screwed up they are and how much you know and why they need to be just like you or like me. If you're living the life God leads you to live, if you're living the life as a spirit leads you, there's going to be something about you that's attractive in some way, okay? God will lead you when to evangelize. God will lead you, and that evangelizing may be listening to somebody that's struggling and just empathizing with them. It may be helping them out with some very real practical need that they have. It's not about checking off numbers, how many people we, how many tracks we can hand out, how many, you know, people we can save. It's about relationship. And the church really needs to become relational in the community. The church is needed today as much as ever. So we are in uh, Genesis chapter 39, and... The very verse, first verse tells us what has happened. It says, now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, right? I'll add as a slave or to be sold as a slave. And Potiphar, an Egyptian officer of Pharaoh, officer of Pharaoh, this guy's a bigwig, okay? He's not like, you know, on the local uh, county commission. This guy is up there, right? He's an officer of of Pharaoh, the captain of the bodyguard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. So now he's a slave of somebody very close to Pharaoh. Interesting. The Lord was with Joseph, so he became a successful man. The very next verse, verse 2, he's a slave. The Lord was with him. And he became a very successful man. How, how does that happen? It happens because the Lord was with him. That's how it happens. It tells us. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. Now his master saw, what did I tell you? If you're, if you're walking in the spirit, you ain't got to go around telling people about it. right? You don't have to go around acting all that. If you are, you're probably not walking in the Spirit. But get this. Now his master saw that the Lord was with him and how the Lord caused all that he did to prosper in his hand. That's just amazing. If you consider Egypt 3,500 years ago, age of the pharaohs, and a foreign slave has uh, arrived... And he's becoming successful. 
I mean, I think to most slaves, you're successful if you get your food every night and you're not beaten for screwing up. That would be considered successful. You lived for another day. So Joseph found favor in his sight and became his personal servant, and he made him overseer over all his house, and all that he owned he put in his charge. It came about that from the time he made him overseer in his house and over all that he owned, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house on account of Joseph. Just because he was near him, he was getting blessed. This pagan, this false god, idol-worshiping Egyptian, God's blessing him. We have to be careful sometime in religiosity. We start to think that, you know, we get stingy with God. God can't bless those people. They don't believe like we do. God can bless who he wants. And there's not a person on this planet that wasn't made in the image of God. Now, they may not be living that out. I mean, some, some people doing some very bad things. They don't know who they are. They just don't know who they are. But Joseph seemed to know who he was because he had this relationship. Thus the Lord's blessing was upon all that he owned in the house and the field, so he left everything he owned in Joseph's charge, and with him there he did not concern himself with anything except the food which he ate. You're blessed when you have that kind of employee, when you have that kind of manager of your business. And it's not saying that Potiphar was lazy and just took vacations all the time. But he was able to go and do his other official duties because he had a servant that he could trust in all situations. And we're going to find out all situations. And that's a rarity. That's a rarity today. Now, Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. Why would the Bible just put that in there? Handsome in form and appearance. And it came about after these events that his master's wife looked with desire at Joseph and said, lie with me. She doesn't mean go tell some tales. She's not saying go fib. Maybe later go fib about what happened. His big boss's wife is coming on to him. Now, right off the bat, he's kind of between a rock and a hard place. I mean, when you think about it, it's not an easy position to be in unless you're that kind and you're just an opportunist, and then he could have complied, right? I want to point out, well, we're, let me go a little further and you'll kind of get this. But he refused, and he said to his master's wife, Behold with me here, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house, and he has put all that he owns in my charge. There's no one greater in this house than I, and he has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. And I don't think Potiphar had to tell him. He knew. How then could I do this great evil and sin against God? Now, maybe if it would stop there, if it would have stopped there, maybe it wouldn't have been sexual harassment. Men can get harassed too. Believe it or not, it can happen, especially if you're in a place of employment with someone that's over you. I mean, you know, I think there was a movie or two about that. And unfortunately, it happens to women way too often. But she's persistent. Some people don't take no for an answer. For some people, no becomes a challenge. And she speaks to Joseph, it says, day after day. Dude. Now listen, I'm assuming Potiphar had a very attractive wife. I mean, he was the 
in charge of the bodyguards of Pharaoh. He could have whoever he wanted, okay? And day after day, the Bible gives us the richness, the texture of what is going on here. So the Sunday school kind of image, at least I had gotten, maybe it wasn't presented that way, was that, you know, Joseph, he flees, and you flee temptation, right? As soon as you have a temptation, you flee. Well, Joseph resists, but where is he going to flee to? Where is he going to flee to? He's kind of stuck in the position that he's in. Solomon writes a bit about adulterous affairs. He says, and and, and it, it puts this in the form that it puts it in, so just bear with me. Do not desire her beauty in your heart, nor let her capture you with her eyelids. For on account of a harlot, one is reduced to a loaf of bread. I know, Proverbs, sometimes it's like, what? It really was kind of poetic, but a loaf of bread, well, think about it. A loaf of bread, if you you step off in this direction, your life's not going to be worth 50 cents. Oh, wait a minute, we have inflation today. It, you, your life won't be worth $5. Okay, that's what it means. And an adulteress hunts for the precious life. The precious life. There are women and there are men. The recent case I heard of, sort of secondhand, I'm not going to go into it, was the case of the man who, despite being married, makes sport of seducing married women because he finds that to be like a boost to his ego, I guess. I don't know. He gets some kind of thrill if he can take a man's wife. There are people that look for the challenge in their own sickness, in their own dysfunction, in their own issues. They look for the challenge and they are completely immune to even thinking about what damage they're doing. And But I do have to tell you that in counseling I have found that children and teenagers and sometimes young adults going back to childhood or teenage years holding really deep resentments against the parent that went out and cheated. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not blaming anyone. I, I don't know all the circumstances and whatever. But the point is, regardless of the circumstances, damage was done because they know the difference between parents remarrying, parents moving on after a divorce, as painful as that might be to them. But in the marriage, it like, it, 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 Very painful to them. Very, very painful to them. Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Or can a man walk on hot coals and his feet not be scorched? So is the one who goes into his neighbor's wife. Whoever touches her will not go unpunished. Now, I would have read this, and I did kind of legalistically. God's going to get him. Listen, it may not be that. They can, there's a lot of ways you can get punished in the relational damage that's done, marriages that are broken, other family members that cut you off. There can be a very, very heavy price in causing this kind of pain. So it's not something new. We think that Oh, you know, there's so much the world is over-sexualized, and it is. Hollywood, pop culture, I mean, they take the most deviant things and try to put it out there as just a okay alternate way. Nobody gets hurt. It's all good. Whatever works for you. Joseph could have rationalized this 20 different ways. Maybe some excuses are coming to mind, but there are certainly some excuses he could have come up with. You know, 
and tried to excuse himself from any blame or, or just not thought about it and just, hey, you know, go with the flow, dude. But he doesn't do that. Day after day, he did not listen to her to lie beside her or be with her. But he does make a mistake. It's an honest mistake. He finds himself one day alone in the house with her. When I was a field appraiser for the county years ago, worked with a really good guy. He kind of trained me in on the field appraisal stuff. And I remember the story, you know, the woman comes to the door, you know, in the negligee. And, oh, come in, let me offer you a cup of coffee. And he was like, you guys say he was square, but it was really beautiful. He was like, uh, no, ma'am, uh, Miss Kelly would not approve of me doing that. And he wouldn't go in the house because we weren't supposed to go in the house anyway in most cases, Miss Kelly being the property appraiser that he worked for. You know, he didn't say, like, you know, he didn't, like, make it like it was her fault. He was just like, N- it's just not, I'm not allowed, you know. And he wouldn't even, he wouldn't even allow himself to be put in a situation that was probably nothing and nothing would happen, but he wouldn't go there. Joseph finds himself alone in the house with Potiphar's wife, right? And none of the men of the household were there. Accountability. Accountability. Now, we can trust ourselves all we want. I was amazed. I was surprised. I and mean, I was pleasantly surprised. I remember Dale Ingersoll, Westside Baptist years ago, was talking about something on the theme of adultery and affairs, and he said, you know, he said, it could happen to me. I could, in a, in a weak moment of temptation, you have to be aware. You have to be aware. And you also have to know what triggers us that is when am I more vulnerable you know in recovery and I think this applies to a lot of other things besides alcohol and drugs we use um, an acronym it's B like letter B halt H-A-L-T when I'm bored bored housewives I mean that's just a cliche Hungry, that's a big one for me. The next one goes with it for me. Angry, hangry, hanger is a very real thing. Lonely and tired. We don't make the best decisions. Well, fortunately, Joseph didn't make a really bad decision. He just allowed himself to be where he probably shouldn't have been knowing how strongly that Potiphar's wife's had it out for him. And she goes for him, right? She grabs a hold of him and basically says something like, you can read it, take me now, you know? I mean, she's got his her arms around him, and he jerks, he throws himself away, and he runs out the door. He did the right thing, except... She hung on to his coat, or she tore it and had a big piece of it. And what does hell hath no fury as? <laughs> well, it, at least that's true in this case, because what does she do? She calls in the servants. She said, look what my husband's slave tried to do to me. I mean, I think she knew then he resisted so forcefully that, hey, she ain't going to be able to, you know, win him over. So she's incensed. She is inflamed. She's angry. She's burning, seething mad, you know. I don't know. Maybe she had borderline personality disorder and just couldn't, couldn't stand rejection. But for whatever reason, she has it out for him now. And then she tells, you know who, captain of the bodyguard hubby, 
Yeah, well, he's not going to be happy about this. Not going to be happy. So she left his garment beside her until his master came home. Then she spoke these words to him. The Hebrew slave whom you brought to us came in to me to make sport of me. I think she was the one that was out for a sporting event. But anyways, and as I raised my voice and screamed, what a liar. I mean, really, he left his garment beside me and fled outside. Maybe she's trying to cover herself, too, just in case. You know, Joseph was pretty shook up. He might have said something somewhere. Now, when his master heard the words of his wife, which she spoke to him, saying, this is what your slave did to me, his anger burned. His anger burned. You know, in that, in Proverbs chapter 6 that we took a little excerpt out of, Solomon goes on, and he basically says, when you get caught, you're not going to be able to buy him off. His anger isn't going to be quenched. He says, people understand when you steal food because you're hungry, and you're still going to have to pay that, whatever he said, six or seven times over, and probably empty your household. There's going to be consequences anyway, but people don't, like, despise you. People have some sympathy for stealing when you're hungry, but this is a kind of theft that God doesn't look lightly on. Right? Whom God has joined together. Let no one break apart. So what does he do? He puts him in jail. Takes him to the jail. The place where the king's prisoners were confined. Listen, I don't think the king's prisoners were treated much or any better Right, Because the king's prisoner, I mean, this is like, it's a serious offense. Probably basically a holding cell till execution time. But the Lord was with Joseph. Didn't we hear that before? The Lord was with Joseph. He's in the pit. He isn't killed, even though they wanted to murder him. He's sent off into slavery. He ends up in a position of authority as a slave. He's still a slave, but he's a high-level slave. Now he's in prison looking pretty bleak. But the Lord was with Joseph and extended kindness to him and gave him favor in the sight of the chief jailer. Favor in the sight of Potiphar. Now he's got favor in the sight of the chief jailer. The chief jailer committed to Joseph's charge all the prisoners who were in the jail so that whatever was done there, he was responsible for it. The chief jailer did not supervise anything under Joseph's charge. Sound familiar? And whatever he gave Joseph to do, he didn't have to be concerned about it because he knew that it got done right. Joseph is kind of a superstar. I mean, as a worker goes, wow, God's with him, and that is way cool, and it's also very cool that Joseph must have kept his focus on God. I mean, look what he resisted. Look at the temptation that he resisted. Look at all the excuses he didn't come up with to do what he could have done for instant gratification. He focused on God. He didn't fall into the temptation. And now, when he's thrown in jail, when most people would be miserable, I think that would be a horrible, right? It would be in an Egyptian dungeon all those years ago with no advocate, no public defender, no private lawyer, no one to speak on your behalf, no one on the outside that even knows you except your master and his wife, and there's no love lost there for you. So what can we take out of this? 
so far that it is possible to have faith in God, that it is possible to resist temptation, that it is possible to let go of those things that are maybe that monkey on our back, whatever that is for you. I know with those things that it was for me. But God, but God, and no matter what we've done, even the worst vile things, God loves us anyway. And God will forgive us, and God will give us a new start. And we can see from Joseph so far that he's got us in the palm of his hand, no matter how bad it looks out there. And right now, I mean, Joseph's got a nice little job. The chief jailer's looking at, you know, has a his own vested interest because he's got a capable guy that can be the orderly, that can do all these things, but he is in prison. And that's where we're going to leave off with Joseph for today. Good job, Bob. So Joseph, the trustee, the trustee, that's what they call him nowadays, right? Uh, so it was interesting no ma- that Bob said no matter what we do, but how about this? Joseph kept his faith no matter what other people did to him. I mean, his own brothers. That's where I went. His own brothers. Well, let's not kill him, but we'll sell him into slavery. That, let them kill him. <laughs> that's really what it, what it meant back then, right? And even still, how, how is it, I guess make it personal, how is it that you keep faith no matter what other people are doing to you? That's the hard part, isn't it? I mean, it's real easy to get discouraged the way people treat each other, especially nowadays. You look at somebody sideways on the highway and they want to point a weapon at you? A few weeks, a few weeks ago, I, I was seeing on the news a guy on a motorcycle, a road rage incident they actually ran him off the road on his motorcycle and killed him what's that all about quite vulnerable on a motorcycle guys in case you're not a rider i am don't cut me off in traffic please because i looked at you funny (laughs) that just looked funny (laughs) let's go back to the top of this so god is with joseph in the middle of all this i'm filling in your blanks on your study sheet if you're following along god is with joseph So, therefore, that being said, he enjoys great success. Now, that kind of rises to question, what is success for you? What's success? I have people for years tell me, you know, oh, you need to, you know, when I was doing signs and coming up with slogans, you need to be in New York City or be in Atlanta and make that big money. I'm like, well, to me, that's not successful. Success to me is having a nice little peaceful home. Here in Fort Pierce, not fighting traffic, not driving six hours each way to work for an eight-hour day. Eight, nine, 11, 12, 13, 14, 20 hours a day put into a work so I can make big money and have stress and die early of a heart attack. So, uh, so what is your success? I think that is a place where you have to start this measurement too. But Joseph, I don't imagine, felt very successful when he was sitting in the bottom of the well, and then they decided, well, let's not leave him there. We'll drag him out, sell him into slavery. You're doing what? Oh, yeah, I'm going places. (laughs) And then he's brought into Potiphar's life. But Potiphar, I'm glad you pointed it out, saw that the Lord was with Joseph. And I say this all the time here. You don't have to tell people you're a Christian if it shows. My Australian buddy said, you know why people got Jesus on their license plate? So why is that? On their bumper? You know why they got Jesus on their bumper, matey? Why is that? Because he's not in their heart. They're, sometimes people are trying to convince themselves. And you have to be careful of that. I have to be careful. Let's put it that way. I have to be careful of it. Um. What I've learned is in difficult times, how do I get through what other people are doing to me without taking a personal offense? And you got to go to God and say, what's going on here? And a lot of times what I hear in my prayer is, not your job. I got this. (laughs) And it's important to hear that. 
And Bob, Bob and I had that occasion. I was ministering over at Archie's one time, and there was a guy out in the audience, and he was obviously troubled and sitting there weeping. And Bob said, I felt like I needed to go over and say something to him. And I came up behind him, didn't know what to say. Remember that? And he said, so I said a quick prayer. Okay, God, what do I say? He said, I heard it just as plain as day. I got him back away. See, if God's not leading you, then who is? Well, how do you know you're supposed to go minister to somebody? You know, do you have to, you have to, everybody you meet, do you have to walk up to their face and shake your finger in their face and say, do you know the Lord Jesus as your personal Savior? Look at me, look at me, look at me. That's what that says to me, unfortunately. And I was with people who would do that. It's like, will you please stop doing that? We could have had a nice little relationship with this fellow by stopping in here every week for a Coke, but you kind of pushed him into a corner. <laughs> He, don't, he probably cringes when you walk up now, like, oh, he's going to do it again. <laughs> you build the relationship first. And you allow, I allow, like when I go back to Maine, I had a wild life up in Maine. I don't know if you know, but <laughs> when I go back, people are like, they heard I'm a pastor. And they, get, and they keep their distance for a while. And I just go back and I be myself, who I am now not who I was then. And eventually they go, so what happened to you? <laughs> well, it's a funny thing you ask. I heard you're a pastor. Yeah, I am. I couldn't believe it when I heard that. Yeah, well, neither could I. <laughs> I wouldn't have believed it either if I knew me, and I did, and I don't. So, But it shows. God will show in your life if you're leading such a way. The cracked vessel lets the light through. <laughs> Who's cracked? <laughs> and we all are. So God's blessing, then God's blessing extended to those around him, including his master. Huh. A pagan captain of the guard. Huh. And others see God working through you. Others will see God working through you. I was I was blessed one time. When I first got saved, I, was, I found myself like stopping and feeding homeless people and inviting people to church. And I, this one guy, is, I called the church, and I said, look, I'm, this guy, I invite him to church. I want to bring him to the church dinner on Wednesday night. But I want to get there early, and we have a shower, and I'll bring him a change of clothes, and we'll have dinner. And, you know, we'll get him a shave if he wants, whatever he wants. I called the church, and I said, would that be okay? And unfortunately, the secretary at the time, she goes, you know we have a dinner tonight. Yeah, that's why I want to bring him. Well, you can't just bring homeless people here. I thought that's what we were teaching. How does that work? So then I called the associate pastor, and I said, this should not have happened. I mean, I'm brand new in the church. I'm trying to bring somebody in and help them, and I'm told don't. That don't make sense to me. So there's a lot of things that can be confusing. But I think we were going to a good church, and, and I think that person understands now where I was coming from. But what was funny is her husband eventually said, you know, I wish I could be like you, Dave. Just accept people and love them where they're at. And you, Heck, you have them move into your house. If, if it, I said, well, I would, except I've got a wife. That <laughs> I, she, well, that has to be her safe place, too, and that's my priority. Plus, when I look at this guy's wife, <laughs> uh, I'm glad she's over there talking. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, let's move on to Potiphar's wife. <laughs> so Potiphar's wife wants Joseph. I mean, this is, do you think there's something attractive about this guy? Yeah. Everywhere he goes, the guy's a slave and he becomes a ruler. He gets the best of everything. He's being blessed no matter what happens to him. So she attempts to seduce him, but he rejects her advances. How good are you at that in the middle of a seductive moment? I can say I'm better at it now than I used to be, but then again, it don't happen anymore. <laughs> and things have changed. He chooses loyalty and God over self-gratification. I think that's a key thing to being attached to the vine all the time. When Jesus is living in you, who are you going to listen to? John English. God bless you. <laughs> uh, 
Um, but vengeance is hers. She takes on. She makes sure it costs Joseph dearly. Again, you think he's feeling kind of blessed here when she starts telling lies about him? How is he dealing with that? So Joseph, who was only a slave, goes a step further down the scale into being an inmate. And an inmate of the king, you mentioned that, like how do you think the king's, the king's um, prisoners were treated? Probably a whole lot worse because the big offense was against the king. And like you said, they're probably heading to execution, right? But God was still with him. And Joseph is placed in charge because God still shows. God still shows. God still shows. And the chief jailer begins to trust Joseph. I think that's probably where the word trustee comes in when we have our modern day prison and jail system. If you're not that bad of a, if you're not a violent prisoner, uh, they can put you in a trustee position, especially if you know the right people. Well, he seemed to know the right people. I mean, he was part of his buddy before the lies all ca- happened. And as we get to the end of this week's saga, um, what kept coming up to me is um, when you said day after day, day after day, she kept trying to break him down. Kept trying to break him down. She was persistent, yet he was also persistent in his faith. My mind goes to music, tempted by the fruit of another. <laughs> right? And, um, but, you know, our world, like you said, has changed over the years. What we perceive to be okay has changed. And I think it started back in the 60s and 70s. Yeah, who remembers that Crosby, Stills, Nash song? When you can't be with the one you love, of the one you with. That's a difficult thing because they've, we've kind of come in our head like, well, it's okay. We can justify that now. It's, it's only natural. <laughs> no, it isn't right if it's not right. And how do you know it's not right? Well, because of the law. How about this? Because of the spirit. Right? Travis and I were over there and... The leadership of the spirit happens in persistent thoughts, little thoughts that you don't even think are going to happen. Something silly, like Travis said, you know, he's packing up to do a job. He does a moving job. And this little thought, maybe you need a stepladder. Well, logically, no, I'm not going to need a stepladder. And you argue with the little persistent thought. And then you go without the stepladder and you get to the job and go, huh, you know, if I had a stepladder, (laughs) I'd be able to take that picture off the wall. And move, the move would be complete, right? Persistent thoughts. Um, The very first time it happened for me was passing a homeless person. I was about two weeks saved. And I was reading this little tract about how do you hear from God. And what I'm learning through John Glenn is four steps. Persistent thoughts. So you're going to keep hearing the thought, okay? It's going to line up scripturally. In other words... You're not going to get the persistent thought that says, go rob the 7-Eleven. That's not a God thought, okay? It's not a God thought. It's not a God thought, hell. <laughs> Throw it away. <laughs> he was like, darn it. <laughs> the third one is um, circumstances will start to happen. So you'll be able to do what the persistent thought's doing. And the fourth one's the key. Do what the Spirit leads you to do. So those are the four steps. Um, so I was passing this homeless guy, and it was the first time I really remember kind of hearing a thought from God was turn around and give him an apple. I know some of you heard this story a million times. He's going over it again. There's new people here. Deal with it. <laughs> and I'm arguing with the thought. Well, no, I got this one's breakfast. The next one's lunch. I'm on a diet. I'm going to get skinny again. You see how that's working. And I get to the light, and I heard it again. Go give the guy an apple. No. Nope. That one's my lunch. Get to the next light. 
And I heard it like it was almost my own voice. Dude, you have two. You don't have any. Turn around. And when I got there, I knew that that's exactly what I was supposed to be doing. Because when I walked up and I said, hey, man, what's your name? He said, he started weeping. He said, it's been six years since anyone cared what my name is. I start weeping. And I'm not supposed to cry in public, according to my upbringing. You don't cry in front of people. But I start weeping, and I'm like, wow. I knew this was God changing my heart. And I've learned over the years to stop arguing with him. And I've said, I was telling Travis again today, I said, when I get to a fork in the road, yeah, you, who does this when you get to a fork in the road? Do, do you, like, take a second to figure it out? Anybody? Come on. Nobody? Yeah. Oh, is that what you do? <laughs> I have, I just kind of, like, wait. Like, I don't stop. I, like, stop in the middle of the road like I'm, you know, how do you, how do you get a, a snowbird to stop at a, you know, to come to a stop? You bring them to a traffic circle. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I would just follow the spirit. And I would used to tell people, look, if I feel in my spirit to take the right, I take the right. Well, don't you ever, like, try to rebel against it? And, and we're rebellious by nature, right? Someone says, don't do that. <laughs> Watch this. I'll do it. I stopped rebelling against it. And I realized, I started thinking, well, if God's leading me to the right, then he might be preventing me from getting up to that next intersection that the 18-wheelers rolling through. And people are like, well, that's crazy. You know, you think like that, you know. You know what? So far, I'm still alive. <laughs> and, and I find great joy and trust in God. And I related to another friend of mine who called me, and he was late for work, and he got a flat tire, and he's all greasy now, and he's in his dress clothes, and he's an hour late for work, and he was griping and complaining. And I said, dude, what if God stopped you on the side of the road to prevent you from getting to that next intersection that a truck was rolling through? I mean, can you, can you see the bright side of the story? And I was teaching a class at the time at the church I was in, and this guy goes, yeah, well, what if he pulled off the side of the road and got run over while he was changing the tire? And I'm like, dude, why would you even think like that? He says, well, that could happen too. I said, you're right, it could happen, but why do you go there? I said, look, look at how negative you are and how little peace you have in your life where I can walk through and go, wow, have peace. The choice is yours. How much peace do you have comes along with how much are you trusting the spirit and how much are you looking for the bright side? And the cool part about that story is about three years later, I was pulling into the same church to go. I was actually pulling out of doing a class and this guy pulled in and I didn't even recognize him. He had a big smile on his face and he saw who I was and he backed up real quick. Beep, beep, beep. He rolled down his window. Dave, Dave, man, it's been a long time. He said, yeah. He goes, remember that time you were telling that story and did it, the guy with the flat tire? Yeah, he says, I get it now. I have peace. I have joy. It's awesome. And you could see the difference in him. You ever seen that in somebody? Yeah. When the spirit takes control, you can see the difference. I think that's what all this is about. So I'm going to call it an end for this episode, and I'm going to pose the questions. Will Potiphar have Joseph killed? Will Joseph survive this vicious lie? Will Potiphar's wife confess to her lie? Tune in next week for the adventures of Joe. (laughs) Let's close with a prayer and get the music going again. We got to get some music in our lives. I don't know about you. Father, I thank you for the leadership of the Spirit. I thank you that the lessons come through persistent thoughts that line up with your written word, that circumstances will align, and it'll be clear what you're called to do. Father, help each and every one of us to step out in faith and do as the Spirit leads so that we can find and begin to produce your fruits, the fruits of the Spirit, peace, love, joy, patience, kindness, gentleness, mercy, and self-control. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on up, kids. By the way, Miss Doris 
You have something, you want to share a little something today? Would you do that? Or you want me to just tell them? All right, stand up and wave hallelujah. <laughs> she, was, she was very stressing for the last few weeks, and she was asking for prayer because her blood things, all the blood tests and stuff were coming back, and something isn't right, and something isn't right. But this week, what happened? Everything's normal. Well, she's not normal, but her blood came back normal. <laughs> Thank God for that. And I want to ask you to pray for my friend Mark, not our Mark here, but my other friend Mark, who is struggling with uh, uh, finding out that he has um, a cancerous lump in his, in his lung. He will have surgery. But I want you to pray that he finds the faith and the peace through God to walk through this because it can be very stressful when you're unsure. So I ask you to pray for my friend Mark and his healing. All right. Let's do a little islandy kind of music. How about that? A little Bob Marley. Dirty remarks. There is one question I'd really love to ask. Is there a place for the, the hopeless sinner who has hurt all mankind just to save his own belief? We're saying one love. To fight this holy Armageddon One love. So when the man comes There will be no, no doom One Take pity on those Whose chances seem thinner Cause there ain't no hiding place From the father of creation Saying warm love and What about the one heart?
set this place on fire. Send your spirit, Savior. Rescue from the mire. Show your servant favor. Yesterday was a day that I was alone. But I'm in the spirit of an almighty God. This might be for you, right here. Did you realize that inside of you there is a flame? And did you ever try to let it burn, let it burn, let it How's he going to melt your heart of stone? Little persistent thought at a time. God bless you. Have a good Sunday. Good job, Bob. Congratulations again to Bob. Getting his state certification out from under him. He's bona fide. Bona fide. All right. What a beautiful day. Get out and do something in it good. I think we might do our band practice out on the back patio. Let the dogs go out front.